Hello and welcome to another installment of Benelord Morning. In today's episode, I'm going to cover how to get custom crossbow meshes, bow meshes, arrows, bolts, and quivers in game, and so that they still use their uh, vanilla features. So let's get to it. All right. So before we jump straight into the workflow itself, I wanted to quickly discuss how did I find about this and uh, sort of explain how how does it work. Uh, by default, within a real-time game engine, you come across usually three different types of animation. Uh, one would be bone animation, second would be your morphs or blend shapes deformation, and then third would be um, deformation within the shader itself, which is then usually masked with vertical colors. They all have their pros and cons, um, and since uh, when I open the, the uh, bow mesh in here, I have the long bow mesh. Uh, I did a quick check on the long bow mesh material, and uh, I saw that first of all, there is no there is no skeleton uh, assigned to this mesh. And uh, upon close inspection of the material, I saw that there is no skinning applied to it. So that told me that the mesh is being deformed using uh, material. If we go up, we actually see that the shader applied to this, um, so the actual specifics and behind the scenes working of the material um, are our usual PBR uh, materials. So if we go into the details of the uh, long bow deformer, we will see that it's um, nothing unusual in here. It's referring to a, a bow deformer RSH, which is a shader file type, and this is where the actual deformation happens. Um, so in order to find out how do we replicate ourselves, um, we sort of figure out that this is now being deformed within the shader, and we know that the easiest way to to uh, mask it out, because it's being vertex displaced, um, the most common usage is through vertex colors. So how do we check what kind of vertex colors um, is this mesh having? One thing that we can do is obviously use T-Pack and get the mesh out of uh, the engine and check it out in a 3D package. Unfortunately, the uh, T-Pack tool doesn't really handle vertex colors very well. Um, I've noticed that the colors do not really sort of replicate or, or respond to the, to the um, in-game mesh. So there is actually a number of vertical color shaders that we can use to preview the, the values being used. So if we open up the material, make sure in the lot zero, otherwise it's going to be, um, you're not going to see the change. So if we click in here and we type in vertex, and vertex color mat is going to apply the, the, the corresponding vertex colors to the mesh as an unlit semi-translucent material. So we can see that the bow mesh itself is blue. And the string is using blue and green. So they're, bo they're both using different kinds of deformations and are being masked out by blue and green channel. Uh, when we look at, for example, crossbow, crossbow itself is going to have a similar approach. We see that the body, for example, is completely transparent. Um, not that it really matters in this case because the only thing that's being used to deform um, is once again only a blue and a green channel. And uh, when we look at the quivers, that's a slightly different story because the quivers are not being deformed. But I'm sure as you've noticed, um, when you go below eight, um, eight ammo count, the arrows start to individually disappear. And uh, that is once again being done through vertex colors. So if we apply the vertex color material to it, to lot zero, sorry, we'll see that it is actually being white. There is a little bit of a uh, teal within the quiver, but the main key is within the translucency of the material because you have three um, colors for, for vertex colors. You have your red, green, blue, and you also have your fourth channel, which is alpha. And alpha is in this specific vertex color material is being used as transparency. So we can see that some of the bows, so some of the arrows have different transparency. And so that's how it's done. It's using the 
alpha channel of these arrows as an opacity mask and it's simply shifting that that sort of threshold of the opacity mask value um, down as you go down uh, within your ammo count. So now that we know how it works, we can start getting our custom meshes uh, into the engine. There are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. Uh, it's mostly proportions and then obviously the specific vertex colors to, to uh, get it working properly. In the zip file, you'll find four different files, one for the ammunition, one for bows, one for crossbows, quivers, as well as a JPEG, which highlights the attachment um, bones for your quivers. More on that later, um, as well as a XML template file for the uh, assets and which kind of lines you should pay attention to in order to get your meshes to work the way you want to. Let's start with an easy one. Let's start with the ammunition. So we're gonna bring in the arrows and bolts. I try to keep it somewhat organized. Um, so I have a layer for the custom meshes, which I try to include in every file, as well as vanilla assets. In terms of arrows, there's only sort of one thing you need to keep in mind, and that's the length. Because obviously when you draw either a long bow or a short bow, the distance between your left and right arm in Bannerlord is about 85 centimeters. So that's the minimum length uh, demonstrated with this arrow for the bow, um, sorry, for the arrow. So if it goes below this threshold, your arrow is not going to go past the bow handle. So it's going to look a little bit off. As for the bolt, we're actually a lot more flexible in terms of length, simply because we have uh, flexibility within the XMLs where we can set the ammunition offset. As for the custom mesh itself, besides the length, uh, what you need to keep in mind is to make sure that your feathers are two-sided. You could do that within the material, but I wouldn't recommend it because then you're rendering all of the faces as two-sided, which is, you know, wasteful. Um, and the actual more efficient and cheaper thing to do is just to take the, take the mesh, duplicate it and flip it. Let's move on to the crossbows next. So we bring in the crossbows FBX. Once again, I try to keep it organized. I have a reference and a custom mesh. So let's take a look at the reference first. Um, you'll find the geometry straight out of TPEC as well as two helpers. If we look at the vertex colors of the reference mesh, you'll actually find out the flaws of TPEX. Um, in this case, I get no vertex colors at all. Um, so that's why it's actually best to check it out in the editor first. Unfortunately, you don't get exact values with that. Um, then the helpers are there. One is for bold location. So that one helps us to define the ammo offset in the XML, which we will cover a little bit later. But uh, when you create your custom mesh, position your helper where you want it to be, and then write down the location in meters, because that's the default uh, default unit for the XML. Then the second helper is for the string stretch distance, uh, meaning how far is the string supposed to be sort of pulled back when it's when the ammo is being loaded. Um, Bannerlord actually uses the green value to, to define the distance, which has a maximum of 255. Um, and it actually corresponds to 255 millimeters. So it's one to one, one millimeter and one uh, in the in the color value. So if we look at the default uh, measure distance of the helper, it's 255 millimeters or 25 and a half centimeters. So if we take the vertices of the string in here, and we pull it back, keep an eye on the Z value over here as we push it down and we reach approximately 255. Obviously you wanna smooth these out a little bit to give it a little bit of a more curved uh, if, you're, if you have the geometric for that. So how do we apply this to um, our custom mesh? 
Uh, one thing to keep in mind with the crossbow is the only interactive and deformable part is the string and then the arms. The trigger plays no part at all. So that can be located wherever you want. Um, your arm is somewhere approximately here. Um, so that's just the only thing that you can you have to sort of keep in mind in terms of proportions. Everything else is actually flexible. So as we discussed, the bolt location and how far the string is being pulled. Um, as you can see in this case, my string in its idle state is is off um, when compared to the vanilla reference. So let's hide the, that mesh and take a look. Um, my ball location has moved. So I would write down these values currently in centimeters. I would convert them to meters, which is going to give me the, the exact value. You can bring in a bolt mesh if you have a specific one in mind and locate it where you want it to be. Um, and as for the stretch distance, this is where it gets somewhat complicated. Um, I have sort of already defined how far I want it to be pushed back. So if I take a look at it from front, it starts pretty much in the middle of the string and is being pulled down. I have a plane in here to sort of indicate the the cross section. Somewhere in the middle, um, somewhere in the middle of this apparatus. So if I look at the measurement, I know the height is 124 millimeters. And that's the amount of green value I need to give to the vertices of the string, which are being pulled back. So if I select these, I think in this case, I have it set to 123. So I could switch it to 124 if I wanted to go a little bit further back. If I were to give this a value of 255, so the maximum value can be pulled back. Um, I can actually preview that if we keep an eye once again on the Z axis down here. As I pull it down to 255, that would be pulled back somewhere approximately here. Um, so yeah, that's how you would define it. Um, once again, the arms, the vertex colors on my custom mesh, if we take a look at those, uh, we see that the arms themselves are fully blue. You don't need to worry about giving this section like a gradient from black to blue, simply because the shader itself is actually quite clever. Um, and it has like a fading radius uh, along the center axis. Um, so these faces in the in the center will not be pushed back. It has a slow like a decay um, where again the whole mesh is being pulled back, but it has a slow fade to to portray like a realistic bending effect. Uh, what you need to keep in mind is the green value for the for the string. And as we discussed that, that is being defined, um, that is being defined in millimeters. Uh, so once you have that set up, you can hide your helpers because they're not supposed to go with the geometry. They're simply there to, to help you identify these values. And then you simply export the, the mesh out. Thirdly, we're going to take a look at custom bows. Once again, I'm trying to include some vanilla meshes as well as a custom mesh. In this case, we have a we have two reference meshes. It's a short bow and long bow. The engine uses two different um, shader deformers, one for standard bow or short bows, and the other one for long bows. They both have slightly different deformation parameters which are hidden unfortunately so I can't really tell you um, the difference in there but I've included some helpers to help you identify which one should you use. So for the short bow deformer there are bend limits for both top and bottom because sometimes bows can be uh, non-symmetrical or asymmetrical. So if your bow um, exceeds somewhere within this within this area it's going to deform wrongly i'm going to show an example um, on screen when the same mesh uses short bow and a long bow deformer so on the left you will see the same mesh using a short bow deformer and then on the right you see 
a long wooded former. So hopefully that explains the, the, the difference in there. In order to help you identify which one should you use. Again, depends on if the scale of the mesh exceeds any of these uh, helpers. I've included helpers for the bend limit on the longbow as well. Uh, simply because if you exceed that range, even the longbow deformer starts to behave a little bit, a uh, little bit oddly. But the default or the uh, longest vanilla longbow is about 180 centimeters tall, so that should be plenty enough for your custom meshes. There are also helpers for the strings and the string locations. As you can see, the short bow has the string further back than the actual longbow model. Um, the discrepancy, the average discrepancy between those is approximately five centimeters. And that's roughly the size of uh, an adult human palm in Bannerlord. So you actually have a little bit of a wiggle room um, for the string to be sort of hidden behind your, behind your arm. So as long as your string is somewhere within that range, you'll be good. Uh, once again, I'm going to just preview the vertex colors that are coming from TPAC. And as you can see, TPAC is giving me uh, red values and a misplaced yellow values. So it's red and green. So that's why I'm um, not advocating for using TPAC to identify any kind of vanilla um, vertex color values for that, I recommend looking at it inside the editor. So now that we know what the reference uh, meshes look like or what the proportions are and what we should pay attention to, we can bring in a custom mesh. And uh, as we can see, the custom mesh goes beyond the, the limit of the um, short bow bend limits. So I should definitely be using a long bow deformer because I know that it's going to um, deform properly. And then as for the string, it's actually somewhere in between. So I know I'll, I'll be safe in terms of the actual vertex colors I should be using. It's once again defined by blue and green. So the whole body is blue, uh, just like with the crossbow, there is a natural fall off built within the shader for the blue or the blue values so you need to you don't need to worry about adding in your own sort of gradient ramp um but if for some reason you have a body that is not supposed to deform at all you should keep this uh fully black then the green value for the string um i keep them at 255 so full range um that seems to be the the, uh, the reliable way so unlike with a crossbow, you don't really have that amount of flexibility. Um, obviously, if your if your string in its default state is going to be outside of that range, that you would certainly want to decrease the amount of green value because that will reduce the amount of pushback. But once you have that set up, you can just export that mesh out and you'll be able to, to bring that in. And lastly, we're going to take a look at quivers and they are same for both sort of bolts and arrows. Um, I've included references to the meshes because we know that we can't use TPEC to, um, to identify the exact vertex colors, which we should be using. Um, the references are here simply for proportion checking, um, uh, you'll find out that the quivers are symmetrical in terms of the body, because if you take a look at the bone attachment image, you'll find out that some of the bones turn the quivers um, on its z-axis. So that's why they were built symmetrical. Um, in my case, my custom quiver isn't symmetrical. And there might be the case with yours as well. So I've included an indicator which uh, says which way is actually facing front. Um, so in this case, if this was attached to the back, I know that the back is facing this way. 
so I know that this will be facing me. Um, when we look at the meshes, you'll see that it's split into individual assets in here, simply there to make uh, placement and uh, assignment of vertex colors easier. Um, as we've identified earlier, we know that the vertex color plays no part in here. It's the vertex alpha. And unlike the colors, it doesn't use range from zero to 255. It uses range from zero to 100. The 100 value is being reserved to the quiver. So the alpha for all of these vertices is set to 100. Um, I've noticed that the quivers are using vertex color um, of a teal, so 255 in green and blue in the middle, but I haven't found out like what is it doing really. So it shouldn't really matter at all. Uh, what matters is the alpha, so 100 to the quiver. And then you'll find that the arrows, and uh, there are eight meshes, so you should be having eight separate or eight, eight models. Uh, and they're being stepped by a value of 10. Uh, I've put the values that, it, that they should have in these brackets. Um, so you're gonna have an easier time assigning them. I've tested them vehemently, so I know that these values will work properly. They have their pivots uh, properly aligned. So if you were to import a custom bow mesh, sorry, custom arrow mesh, which has the pivot at the world um, origin at the bottom, you should be able to make a quick uh, alignment to these placeholders. Um, let me check. Pivot point, pivot point, there we go. You might have to flip the axis on these. And then uh, what you would want to do is do a little bit of a little bit of a cleanup. You can scale them down and get rid of any faces that are not, not visible. As to yeah, to not render anything that you don't want to. Well this should help you this should help you with the with the placement a little bit. And then in the brackets you will find the value that you should use for the entirety of the mesh. So in this case, the brackets is 55. So I should give it uh, the value of, of 55. Um, eight arrows in total. Before you export it out, you have to make sure that there is only a single object being exported out because by default, uh, the importing process in Bernalot is going to split each object into a different model. So yeah, once you're done with the placement and you're done with the uh, adequate vertex alpha assignment, just make sure you merge it into a um, correct sort of single mesh object, and then you can export it out. Uh, so that should be for that should be all for quivers. One thing to mention is obviously the bolts and arrows are using the same logic, and if you want it. You could reuse the same quiver model um, for arrows and bolts, even though the actual ammunition projectile mesh is different. So I have my meshes ready and I have my textures already imported in here. So I'm going to start importing in a crossbow that we exported out. As for the material, uh, I'm not going to start from a scratch. I'm going to create an override. So let's right click, create override material, and I'm going to find crossbow and then any of the latter ones. That way I can just rename this to custom crossbow. And I have to worry about the textures only because the shader itself is being assigned to crossbow deformer and the values uh, are already assigned to it. So I'm just going to give it the right textures, save, and then select my model, assign the material and save. So when I preview it, it works just fine. And then we're gonna move on to the bow. There we go, same process, create material override. For that, the bows are not separate into long bows or cross bows, just pick one and then after you name it, 
make sure it's using the right deformer. So either longbow deformer or just bow deformer. There is no short bow. Short bow is just bow. Uh, so one, so I know that the longbow is there. I'm just gonna assign the correct the the correct textures. Save it and assign it to my mesh. Once again, preview preview it. Everything works fine. Uh, we move on to the quiver. For the quivers and arrows, you should keep them in the same texture texture sheet and therefore the same material. Unfortunately, this one, this mesh wasn't made for Benelord in mind. And so I ended up with two different materials. Um, so I have to create two materials as well. Create override. And if we type in quiver, you'll find out that they are uh, using bolts, arrows and quivers in a single material. So they're trying to be, you know, as efficient as possible. Uh, we're just going to rename this real quick. We're going to assign it our custom textures. We see that the former is set to quiver deformer. The only thing we got to check is if it has alpha test enabled so that we know that um, our alpha mask in the diffuse is working. And I'm going to create a duplicate for that because I'm using another texture uh, set for the uh, bows for the, sorry, for the arrows. But I got to make sure that this new material, even though I'm reusing the textures, is using the quiver deformer. So if I go into the quiver itself, I should be able to assign. So there we go. Once we updated it, it's going to show up. So that works just fine. And as for the arrow, uh, bringing the arrow model and the arrow as well as the bolt should be using the same material as the quiver or the arrows used in the quiver. So if we sign it there, we save it. There we go. It's working just fine. All right. So now that we have our meshes ready, um, make sure you write down the names of the models in here. These are still using use old ones, but this is what I refer to as mesh name. So uh, either keep this resource browser open or write them down somewhere so you know which one to use in the um, XML editor. So now we have the models, materials, um, everything else sorted out in the SDK. We are now ready to test it out in the game. Um, so we're going to open up our string weapon templates as well as our weapons XML uh, in the sandbox score modulator single player items. Uh, so we can then test it, test it in game. Um, so we're just going to open that and we will be pasting everything somewhere um, at the bottom. So we don't, we don't have to worry about the location of those. Uh, if we look at the templates, what do you need to pay attention to in here? I split it into um, sections in here. So that should be easy for you to find out which um, item you're referring to since they're all within the same XML. Um, ID, flexible, the name once again, start with an alphabetical one so that you can quickly find it. Um, Body name doesn't really matter. You can keep it as it is. Mesh name is the model name. So that's what we, uh, what we've given it in our 3D package and what it's showing up as in our resource browser. Uh, and then for the bow, what matters is the item holster. So that's the attachment bone when it's being unequipped. You have up to four different variants or four different um, options because you can have four weapons equipped in Bannerlord. Obviously, you wouldn't have four branched weapons because you have no ammunition, but there are up to four possible options in case any of the previous ones are being used. So it's going to go and check if bow hip is available. If not, it's going to look for the other one, third one, and then the fourth one. Uh, the full list of 
uh, bows, uh, bones that you could use. Um, should be somewhere online and unfortunately have those. But uh, these should do you just fine. Uh, you can put it on your hips and you can put it on your backs. Uh, technically you could put it everywhere else if you want it. But um, this is obviously preferred for animation purposes. If we scroll down, we're going to get into crossbow. Crossbow, similar process. Um, what we need to worry about is the name so that we can quickly find it in the inventory and the mesh name. In here, you will find, uh, once again, item holsters. So that's the attachment bone. And in here, you will find position shift. So that's, uh, that's in meters again where the bone offset is being applied to. Um, so you can offset it where it's being attached to. And lastly, you'll find ammo offset. So the helper that we had in our 3D package, the location of those, this is where you would paste your, your information. Um, so as you can see, these are quite small values by default. That's simply because it's using meters as its default uh, unit. So this is where you paste the uh, bolt location helper location. There we go. Uh, if we scroll down, we're getting to custom arrows. Uh, this one gets slightly complicated because it's combining both the arrow as a projectile weapon, mesh as well as the quiver one. So you see, uh, again, name, and then the mesh for the arrow itself. So for the single projectile, then the holster mesh, which is the quiver. Holster mesh with weapon, that's if you have separate um, separate quivers with the, with the mesh, with the weapon. You can think about the step bows. Uh, they're using holstered meshes with weapon. Then we have flying mesh. Uh, I think all the arrows and the bolts are using this mesh. It's a very sort of simplified, I think like a six-sided cylinder with no tip and no feathers to it, simply because the projectile is moving very fast. So you don't really notice it being different. Uh, so I would recommend that keeping the same. Otherwise you could reuse the arrow mesh name in here if you wanted. Um, again, item holster for the quiver. In this case, check out the image file to know which one you uh, want to want to use. Um, I've write in here that you can use different attachment bones, but the loading animations only go for the uh, where the hand right hand reaches to your back or to your right sided hip. Um, some of these locations are using flipped um, direction. So yeah, just keep that in mind. If your quiver has, has different um, geometry facing different way, just something to keep in mind. Uh, back to the XML. Within the cluster, within the arrow XML, you'll find the item component and in here, what you need to pay attention to is item usage. There are two options that you can have. It's either arrow top, so that's the right hand reaching for an arrow from the top, or you have arrow right, so that's if your quiver is on your right side. If you use anything else, if you decide to use arrow left or arrow middle, whatever, it will not load and any animation and it will not load anything at all. Um, you will just not be able to load an ammunition into your weapon. So you have only two options there. And then for the bolts, it's very much the same, just like for the arrows. So quiver for the holster meshes. Um, the only thing there is item usage. Quivers should be pretty much all the time on the right side. Um, they have locations for backtop as well. Um, but 
they have only single animation so they should be left blank because it's only going to use the animation where it's reaching to the right side um, so if you just copy these into the sp items xml replace what you need and uh, you should be able to load the game with cheats enabled uh, and test it out thank you for watching and keep modding this tutorial was possible thanks to the Bannerlord modding community and the Kingdoms of Arda team. Make sure to check out the Discord channels in the link below.